Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Giggle Economy Podcast. I'm your host, as always, David Moscoro, a comedian talking to people while we're quarantined about the stories that change their lives in the workforce. I am joined right now with a very special guest. This is a very special episode. I'm wearing, I'm wearing my very holiday Star Wars uh ugly sweater. I've got the lights behind me. I've got my holiday. Some people call them toboggans. Some people call them a uh, uh, little like beanies, depending on, on, on your regional dialect. Uh, I am happy to be here with Greg Bagoni, who is wonderful and has a wonderful tale of holiday. I think the term we came up with is holiday hospitality, or what I asked initially was, this is, let me back up. I asked if anyone online or on social media had worked in a Santa's village or any kind of Christmas type environment and multiple people directed me to you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm glad to be a part of it. And I can, um, as I said a moment ago, I've got a lot of elf demons. I really need to unload. Uh, I worked in the Santa business for one, uh, one winter and I'm never gonna do it again for as long <laughs> as I live. So take me, take me, like, I want to hear the whole thing. Like I said, this, we're, we're new, pretend that we're at a bar somewhere and I have my cup of eggnog that I already spiked already that I'm, I'm going to enjoy. Oh, I spiked eggnog back here in the kitchen. I'll get that too. Nice. So yeah. Together from halfway across the feel, country. Yeah, feel, feel free to go do that. Mm. Got some Evan Williams nog. I think I was doing my, I, I'm in Austin, Texas. I was doing my, I think it's somewhat similar. I think it's Evan Walker, I think, <laughs> or. So you got a cheap knockoff. I got a cheap knockoff, I think. I don't know. But it's got like, so what it has is, uh, um, not a sponsor of the podcast, but it's it's a, it's a, it's a, maybe a knockoff on that, but it has a Jameson float in there. So it's a nice little extra oh. spiking, you know, kind of a holiday. This is kind of a holiday party kind of vibe. We're going to have, you know, like, Let's 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 get to know each other, and that, that's what I thought. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Cheers, cheers to you, by the way. Yeah. By the way, the worst thing I've ever heard uh, uh, eggnog referred to in the Santa business is a uh, Santa cum. So that's the I can never <laughs> unhear unhear it's, that. It's festive phlegm. So where do you, where does this story start? Tell tell us a little bit about like um, if this the area that you were in, uh, how old you were, what what your last job was before that. I want to know all the backstory. Okay, well I'm a local uh, performer and actor among other things, and and an artist, and I have a lot of connections in the local acting community. And this is something that they do somewhat locally in Hood River, um, which is a very beautiful, picturesque town in the Pacific Northwest. And they have an old train and every uh, December they convert it into a Christmas train, populate it with elves, bring Santa on board, go by Santa's village that is kind of awkwardly cobbled together from <laughs> crappy old plastic <laughs> warehouse pallets and <laughs> covered in grime. And it's because it's the Pacific Northwest you know, it doesn't really snow here until a little bit later. December is mostly very just rainy and soggy and miserable. So it's not as festive as they would uh, like it to be. Sometimes it snows and the gorge is, is gorgeous, just absolutely beautiful. And so the scenery is, is wonderful if you're doing it during the daytime, but they cram in four or five runs a day and it gets dark at like 4 p.m. So anybody doing an evening, uh, evening train they're not going to see much it's just pure darkness the inside of the train is lit so they try and see the scenery and they just see their own sweaty reflections staring back at them and um, they don't like that they paid a lot of money to be on the train and the best thing they can think to do is kind of take out their frustration on whoever is nearest uh, wearing an elf costume and I played that role on many an occasion uh, my the first thing that comes to mind is I always think about that wonderful story that we've probably all heard if you're an NPR fan of, of the Sandland Diaries oh, about course. David Sedaris being crumpet. Uh, I like the idea of, of I'm not I'm just ascribing names to the, to the situation that I've heard of as of now. So I like the idea of a, uh, of an elf being named Soggy. I like that idea. <laughs> what was what was your elf name? Did you my have elf, my elf name was Cough Drop. Uh, mm. It was um, it was a very congested winter towards the end of the we were doing these four times a day and like in the last couple of weeks before Christmas Day it was seven days a week and this was all it was you know you miss all the parties you, you miss it this is your world 
and uh, everyone gave each other the flu. Mm. It's hard to, I mean, you're in this, you're trapped in this uh, enclosed space pretty much all day long. In between runs, you get like 10 minutes to run into the, the crappy little break room <laughs> and maybe uh, microwave whatever you can. I would have those little um, like Campbell soups that you can throw in the microwave and drink directly out of the container. Or I would have a, um, a water uh, a water bottle that I would like empty empty an uh, entire emergency into shake it up and drink the powder to try and keep going, and it was uh, it was a marathon, man. Very very uh, FEMA themed elf elf uh, situation going on in there. Like yeah. um, I I know you said your name was Cough Drop, which I love. I like the idea of every Portland uh, this Hood River train, everyone having like. Like there's sage, you know, she's all about, you know, cleaning her, right. or, or there's patchouli or, or there's, you know, <laughs> or whatever, whatever other uh, Portland name elves can, we can think of, you know, uh, you can call one IPA the elf or whatever, depending on, on his situation. <laughs> but uh, uh, what was the, you were, you were referred to by a friend of a friend, our mutual friend, Kevin Michael Moore. Is that how you got the job or was it yes. some other story? How, how did the interview story? It was it was part of the same circle that I share with Kevin, a lot of local uh, sketch comics and stand ups, and uh, Kevin joined me, and we, he really kept me sane a lot of the time because he was great at just dropping little like acerbic asides in my ear when <laughs> you're surrounded by sugared up farting children <laughs> going around who can make you laugh. I imagine I imagine that the the. the um... You want to be as special because you're you're responsible for creating these lifelong memories that these people have, good or bad. You're you're responsible for it. How right. much did you did you have to buy your own outfit for this elf thing, or were you given? No, they supplied them. They were kind of generic, the kind of thing that you might buy uh, at Target or something like that. And they had dozens of those, and um, you know they would tear, they would start to stink. You do your best to keep them clean, and sometimes, you know. It's a, it's a sweaty biz being on a train. And so you're really doing your best not to ruin everyone's holiday with your with your bodily stench. Um, some achieved that more successfully than others. And how was the situation with working with, because there was, was the end goal. So like you, you see this beautiful scenic, hopefully scenic area on the train, you're going on the train. How long was the whole ride? What did you view? Was there a Santa that you were going to or was a Santa on the train? Tell us a little bit more about what the ride entailed. Right. Well, it was when it went as planned, which it occasionally did. The ride was maybe 90 minutes long. You gave everybody a cup of like watery, lukewarm cocoa and uh, a crummy molasses cookie. <laughs> and uh, you would go. They would play truly wretched Christmas music that we heard thousands of times. Um, and because, you know, copyright issues are a thing, you can't go with the big stuff that everybody knows. There was like something by a local band uh, that was deeply irritating. <laughs> and <laughs> so you go by and you, you get to hype, hey, we're headed towards Santa's village, we're headed towards Santa's village. You go around the bend and you see a bunch of like rusted out cars and things along the route. And if you, if you, I highly recommend going and reading the Yelp reviews for this because a lot of them recount how their children shouted out, Santa wouldn't live there. <laughs> Santa would stand there waving, usually holding an umbrella because it was often raining uh, with a couple of elves also under umbrellas. And then the kids would get really excited. The young kids would, the older ones would be dubious and sullen and would mostly be trying to interrogate you trying to catch you in a lie asking you question after question about santa and uh, you try to you try to answer non-committally because you never know what they heard elsewhere because they'll say well i read this in this book so one of you is lying they're very um <laughs> they're very intense about it. in fact just yesterday i got a text from a friend of mine who knew that i had done this a few years ago and she has a nephew who is getting to be a little suspicious about Santa. Like he's, you know, they get to that age where they're like 90% sure he's not real, but they, they kind of want to uh, hedge their bets. You know, they don't want to like declare that definitively because they're afraid they won't get presents or something. Mm -hmm. 
And so the kids would really be trying to uh, figure that out. But she said her nephew, like he interrogated the woman who dropped off Santa in her car and in fact wrote down her license plate for <laughs> <laughs> further research later. This is this is very good immaterial for uh, Serial Season 3, by the way. Just kind of okay. like, <laughs> that would be so great. I, I just like this little in, inquisitive, I don't know what to call it. Like, um, I, yeah, because you do have a lot of responsibility and they've, they've been, depending on the parent that told them the story, you kind of right. don't know, you don't kind of know the context of what. What's, and, the, what's the canon? What's the Santa canon that yeah. they subscribe to? And I don't want to contradict that or ruin that. And one thing that made that difficult is uh, towards the end of the season, they sell more and more tickets. It gets to be a bigger thing. And uh, towards the end, there were actually eight cars, uh, train cars filled with people. And in order for Santa to see everybody, you need multiple Santas. And you have to really choreograph to make sure that those Santas are not in the same place at the same time, because you don't want to be personally responsible for ruining a kid's uh, faith in Santa even though a lot of the, the kids would, like Santa would shamble on and they would be like, I can see his dark beard underneath the fake one. You're like, well, you know, don't ruin it for the three-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it is one of those, one of those things where it's like, yeah, definitely. I never really thought about it until you make, make till you're talking about it. And I remember from uh, my other, fr my other tales of hearing about people that work in this industry, you're kind of Santa's personal assistant. You're kind of like, Right. His like the devil wears Prada kind of you're the Anne Hathaway character in there <laughs> where where you know uh, Santa needs his bottle of water Santa needs his cup of coffee Santa needs Santa needs to be where they need to be and Santa Santa can't keep up with their schedule all all you need to do is that you need to like Santa can't maintain the artifice only by himself you mm -hmm. know, be around to make sure that you know nothing slips and it, it got to the point where there would be multiple Santas on. As the season wore on, more and more of the bathrooms were destroyed and unusable. Oh, so no. a little kid would have to go to the bathroom. The only way to go would be in the next car. Well, you know, there's a Santa in this car. There's also a Santa in that car. So how do you, you do you hold up a coat or something? So he does, that's very suspicious. <laughs> and so, you know, you would stall. You would say, oh, uh, in, in about five minutes, you can use the bathroom. And then the dads would get in there and be like, are you saying that my kid can't take a shit? You know, just uh, very confrontational. Some very aggro parents, they'd paid a lot of money to be on that thing. And as it wore on and they realized how much they had spent for a kind of subpar uh, experience, they would get really angry. I, I always, I, I, you, you, you keep bringing up really great points that I think that as someone in the industry, I would never have, I would never have thought. I, you know, as someone that just does comedy, I go on stage and no one, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, local comedian no one ever like swarms me on anything other than they, if they like my comedy that's great but i keep thinking like El like Com santa's kind of like elvis santa's kind of like you know you have to put the hood over his and right. then get him out but there yeah. should be really you go ahead him with the proper reverence you have to make a really big deal about the fact that santa's here yeah like if the santa has left the building santa is in the building like it's that big thing but really there should the santa should be like the beetle there should be four of them like right <laughs> and they should all have different personalities it's a lot to take on for one person but i think it'd be great if there was like there was like the santa like there was the beatles there was like a john santa that like he's like yeah i know you don't believe this stuff or whatever you know and, and there's a paul one he's the whimsical one that comes up with his christmas song and there's a ringo paul, one that goes paul would probably be the best santa I yeah think he's the best with people Whereas, then, whereas, whereas George would be like, but what is really, what is, what is the meaning of giving? Like, you know, the, the George Santa would be like, it's, it's, it's about the gift, but it's also about what the give, the message behind the gift or whatever like that. His sitar onto the train. And, yeah. and then it, like the Ringo Santa would be my best because I just like the idea of a Santa wearing multiple rings. You know, I think I take that back. I think Ringo would be a superior Santa. I think Ringo would be the best Santa. I, I get the sense that he would be the best with children. I think so too. Like peace and love is kind of his message. And how can how can that person ever be bad at, at uh, making Christmas guy. dreams happen? This is a digression. <laughs> but if you ever get the chance to read uh, a book called uh, You Never Give Me Your Money, it's about the Beatles, but post breakup. Mm. And how they remained in each other's orbit, sort of and loved each other, but resented each other. 
And Ringo, honestly, is the only one who does not come off as a complete asshole at any point in this book. I, um, I like the digression. I like the idea of, of, well, you know, he wasn't close friends. He was the one that came in later. So that's always the best part of it. Right, slightly, yeah. But uh, hold on. I'm looking this up so I can give proper, uh, proper credit to the uh, writer. You know, as you do this, I also think of another good... Uh, elf name. Miriam Webster would be a wonderful elf name for just <laughs> just a really astute, just one that one uh, an elf that wants to give references. You could be anything. I think that's that's what a fun thing. I've always wanted to work as an elf, but just enough, like maybe just a weekend. I think maybe like yeah, excited. I was, it, I was doing it for 14 hours a day and I yeah. don't really recommend that. I uh, think that improv actors or comedians should definitely just work i think one weekend i think that's like like you know you how you can become a better person if you were in the service industry i think every comedian an actor or improv person could be a better one of those if they worked at in a santa's village I, I can definitely endorse that yeah i mean you you really have to learn to think on your feet when you're dealing with children and trying not to you know traumatize them uh, okay, so you never give me your money. The Beatles after the breakup is the official title, and it's by Peter Doggett, and it's a great read. And I learned all kinds of horrible things about things that they said to each other, such as when John was uh, recording across the universe, and uh, Paul wasn't a fan, and he said, "You know, I don't know. I think there's maybe a little bit too much of an Oriental influence in it." And everybody was yelling at him because obviously it's a dig at Yoko. He's like, "Whoa, what are you talking about? No, I was talking about the music." Like, Paul, come on, man. Yeah. Paul would be very, um, very petty. He would hurt people deliberately and then deny that he meant anything by it. Whereas John just was a hothead who would lash out and say terrible things and then feel bad about it later. And uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting dynamic to read about, like going over the course of uh, the 20 years. I'll definitely check it out. I, I, I also like to, to bring it back to Christmas. I also liked the idea of if, if a coal is punishment for being a bad boy, then Michael Jackson owning the, the copyright laws for uh, the Beatles songs for over 20 years was kind of Paul's coal in his stocking for a while. Oh yeah, for sure. Did Michael get, uh, he, it was only strictly the Beatles songs themselves. Even Michael didn't want to touch Wonderful Christmas Time. Yeah, or, or the Wings discography or anything like that. Right. right. <laughs> um, when you were working, do you remember a, a memory of either an extremely, like a extremely like crap, I don't want to be too mean because this is a, for Christmas, like an extremely like Willy Wonka, if you were to think about all the kids that you could get a Mike TV or you can get a Gus, you know, like you can, or you can get a sweet child like Charlie. Can you do you remember any any kind of images of kids that were really good as opposed to really bad? Any let's do one of each. Like if you can remember one one really sweet kid that you wanted to give the exper best experience to as opposed to one really naughty kid that you did not like care if they had a good experience or not. There, there were way more naughty parents than kids. Most of the kids were great. The worst you could say was that some of them were like super weird, but I loved that. You know, thought, what, do you, what do you mean about that? Expand upon that. There was one kid who was wearing a, a three-piece suit and he was maybe eight years old. And I remember him lecturing one of the other elves about the Illuminati. And I don't know where that came from. And then I brought that up to Kevin, in fact, later. And he, Kevin was like, oh, yeah, that Illuminati kid, he wouldn't leave Santa the fuck alone. So, <laughs> and then the kids, the kids mostly, especially the young ones were, were great. And I, I generally like kids. They're, they're fun to entertain. And um, my gig was, I would say, hey, show me your dance moves. And the kids would you mostly just kind of like flail their arms around and kind of stumble around. And then I would imitate their moves with them. And it was very infectious. And then there would be like a lineup of like four or five year olds who kind of filled up my dance card, couldn't wait to dance with the silly elf. And that was fun. But you know, your, your energy burns up really quick. So that kind of thing, you're kind of over it uh, a few hours into the day. Your body is, is tense because you're in a constantly moving train that is like shuddering from side to side and you're trying to keep your balance for many hours and you know it gets to the point where you do it naturally but then your body gets very sore and uh, you don't even think about it really you know you just kind of like are kind of naturally clenching your body all day so you don't fall into anybody's lap and it gives you a little bit at least in my case I had a little bit of a 
kind of motion sickness, like lingering after it kind of felt like my brain was still kind of shuddering back and forth afterwards, you know. Another great name for an elf is Dramamine. That's another great, wonderful name oh. for an elf. <laughs> Dramamine the elf is, is, is a very good one. Also, not to, not to skip past it, I love the idea of a kid in a three-piece suit talking about the Illuminati to the elves because yeah. technically Santa is an all-seeing eye. Like, like if you're going to be about, you know, all seeing kind right. of like what's going on. He like, they're in our, they're in our phones, man. You got like, you're like, well, come how on. Are you, how, how are you cool with it? Uh, when it's Santa doing it, you know, it's, it's the same as like, my mom once told me that she felt really guilty about the fact that when I was a kid, she perpetuated the Santa myth and, and you know, lied to me. And, but you know, she, she had no problem perpetuating the idea of a, a completely different omnipotent being watching my every move so <laughs> i mean that's the thing i i kind of wrestle i don't have children but if i ever do i keep th i keep coming back to the point of like i think it's kind of okay because I, I don't know if like what's weirder the kid that like finds out that santa's not real or the kid that never learns about santa yeah i agree i think it's fun for them and you know they uh they get to see him in in cartoons they get to see him in in life, in real life, at the mall or what I mean, at the mall during a, a normal year. That is what what, what was what was your best Santa memory like growing up? What could you do you have a memory that really kind of stuck with you before you worked at at the the Santa train? You know, I know I I went to see him uh, every year when I was a young kid at the mall. I were you a cr were you a crier? Like, are there is there photographic evidence of you crying on his lap or? I was gonna say it's kind of unusual that there's not. I don't think there's even any pictures of me with uh, in a Santa's lap in a professional Santa's lap, growing up. I don't think it was ever really that uh, traumatic to me. Although a lot of friends I know now who have kids say that they are terrified at the idea of of anybody coming into their house while they sleep, even if it's Santa or even if it's the lead presence. It's like no, this is our uh, this is our sanctum. We can't have anybody coming down the chimney, man. I mean, Which it's a lot. I, I mean, understand that. I mean, I understand why that would seem kind of creepy. I mean, how many friends do you know that that you are okay with coming in your house in the middle of the night wearing a fur coat? Like, how many are you really? I mean, it's an in one of the weird things that did happen. So we had, you know, multiple Santas, as I said. Some of them, like their their whole bank comes from being Santa once a year. These are the um, the guys who have actually like grown out long white beards. They look like Santa all year, and uh, it it pays off in November, December. Maybe they do you know the occasional acting gig outside of that throughout the year. But really, their entire uh, financial year counts on their their Santa weeks. And I was talking with one of them, and uh, and he was talking about how he gets a lot of gigs on Christmas Eve, rushing from house to house. Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents pay him money to actually be in their house in the middle of the night and kind of like ring his bells so the kids will catch a glimpse of him, will catch him in the act, putting out presents by the tree or something. Wow. That sounds terrifying to me. It does. And he said he does like, that's what he does on Christmas Eve is he just drives around all night for hours like being let into people's houses quietly by the parents and making just enough noise that the kids believe in the magic but i don't know i mean I think if i had kids i think i would avoid that i think that would really freak out a, a young kid i i worry that like what if they 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 see the santa and then they, they get a little glimpse they go back to bed but what if those like those mischievous kids and they peek out the window and they see santa leaving in a ford focus right that exactly. kind of <laughs> takes away some of the magic you know you got to park a good santa a good santa would park a couple blocks away and then walk from house to yeah, house. I, I didn't ask him about that technique. I'm sure he has, has thought of everything beyond uh, what, what we have. But that, I don't know, it seems like you're playing with fire when you bring an actual Santa into your house because some kids are not going to see him and get a little thrill and go back to bed. You know, they're going to want to run up and hug him around the knee or something. I always think sometimes, and I, I don't think it means, I don't think it means that the myth of Santa, I don't think it means to be this way, but it's kind of like a, I don't know if it's a kind of a class class kind of thing because now some people live in like maybe mobile homes or in apartment buildings so having a fireplace is kind of like yeah a wealthier thing have you seen the um 
the Sesame Street Christmas special where the entire plot revolves around Oscar putting a, a bug in Big Bird's ear about that and Big Bird has like a full blown pan uh, panic attack. How is Santa going to get into the apartment building on Sesame Street? No, I have, I have not. I'll check it out. That sounds amazing. It's, uh, it's called Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. It's from the 70s. And so Big Bird ends up going to the roof to try and intercept Santa because he's worried he won't get in. And then it cuts to him and he is frozen with icicles on him. And he looks very much like Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining. <laughs> oh, man. It hadn't come out yet. This is a couple of years before The Shining. But it's it's really creepy to see just like a frozen, like I mean he's fine. He's Big Bird. He's insulated well with all the feathers. But still, he's got icicles on his face. You got to give it to Jim Henson to give him that dark edge to to a uh, to child great. programming. Yeah, and and I think that it's a good story because Oscar asking that that probably is something a lot of children worry about. Like you said, kids who live in apartments or other places that aren't accessible by chimney, and to see. Uh, to see a special revolving around that exact anxiety and to have everything work out in the end. Santa does find a way in and everybody is wowed by it and Big Bird can't figure it out. And they basically like the, um, you know, the human cast members of Sesame Street are like, hey man, some things are just beyond uh, human comprehension. Mm -hmm. Santa is one of them. Uh, when you were talking about like the whole experience and I know that it, it's not easy to be on a train and keep your, your jolliness up to a certain level. But if you could pick a day in the life of an elf, the elf that is cough drop, do you have a day that was perfect? Like just just a perfect 14 hour day. I know that sounds crazy to say now. Such a thing as a perfect 14 hour day. of I know, right. but I'm like something that was almost close to being like, that was, if I had to do this, and we haven't even gotten into, to pay, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll, we'll discuss about, uh, being paid to be an elf and how if that felt good or bad like what what does the check say that, <laughs> that kind well, of you know what they actually took several months to pay us and i had to go on the local news and complain oh wow yeah i had to go on the news with you know the words like christmas elf uh, on the screen underneath me like if you google it you'll find it that's i'll definitely i'll definitely see if i can connect it underneath and put it in the video and the the stupid and then you know everybody leaves their comments on it this is in 2017 um, and there's just people who feel the need to leave the exact same smart ass comment on every article they see just to like reinforce their own bias. And the, the headline will be like local, uh, you know, performer says he hasn't gotten his elf money from the train. And, uh, then somebody will leave a comment saying, oh, it sounds like that train is owned by Hillary Clinton. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? What does that even mean? Yeah, that is, that don't, I, I mean. I, I wouldn't want to ascribe uh, Santa to any political party as he does not live in the United States. He lives in the North Pole. So uh, I don't want to say he can he can have his opinions, but, um, you know, why even bring it up? <laughs> right. Yeah, I didn't see too much of that. I didn't see I didn't see a lot of politics being mentioned on the train, which thank God. I didn't even think about something that you just brought up right now about political Santa's. I, I imagine in a world maybe maybe it's not the world that I, you know, I live in Austin. I used to live in Portland. I've lived in Chicago. I've lived in mostly blue cities in my life, right. um, but I have lived in some exactly. some and some more conservative cities. And I imagine that maybe maybe because of the current administration, I don't know if MAGA Santa is a thing. I haven't even Googled that yet, but MAGA Santa might be a thing that that would surprise me. Well, you know, whether in Austin and and Portland, and in fact most big blue cities. Are similar in that you know you may be in your your haven your bubble but if you drive 30 miles outside uh it's it's very much a different mindset you see a lot of maga stickers and things like that i mean i remember being outside of uh of uh, alamo draft house going to the movies and just seeing a lot of gigantic people waving gigantic flags not gigantic small normal sized people waving gigantic flags <laughs> i'm sure some of the people were gigantic yeah the people were gigantic and ego and 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 uh and bravado, but you know, normal sized. <laughs> right. It's been a very weird time to live in Portland because we've kind of been, by Fox News and stuff like that, we've kind of been made a national scapegoat in a lot of ways. Yeah. People see the, the protests, and in fact, it, it, they weren't that heavy and they weren't that violent 99% of the time, but Fox News or whatever will loop the, uh, you know, the two minutes that were, and they'll show that over and over again for months and present that as if it is happening everywhere in the city, 
all day, all night, when in fact it's a very small corner of downtown where that was happening. And we would get those same like MAGA caravans coming through. They came through my neighborhood, just honking their horns, waving their enormous Trump flags, wanting to like start fights with people. And it's not even like they've shown up to like counter protest Antifa or anything. In this case, they're just yelling at people who were like walking their dog. You know, they, they think of Portland as this evil monolith who is, are not real Americans. And they're here to uh, tell them what's what based on whatever propaganda they've been fed. It was really scary. I, I enjoyed Portland for the, the only fact that, I'm not sure if he still does this or not, but I met the coolest Santa as, as someone adult. I have a photo I was gonna show you. I met, um, I think it's called Hipster Santa. I'm not sure if you- I don't think they're doing that this year because uh, they're not doing many personal Santas this year, but I'm pretty sure he was doing it. As let me a, see if I can put it up to the screen and see if you can see. Yeah, and his Lebowski see. sweater and his yeah. like, glasses. Yeah, and little, you can't really, it's not really a focus on it because there's not a very good camera, but uh, let's see if I can. I mean, he was just wearing, yeah, he was wearing Lebowski and then on his, on his forearms said naughty and nice on both of his forearms. <laughs> it was really great. And I just really enjoyed that aspect of, I like a hip Santa. I remember the first, they started doing that maybe 10 years ago. And the first time I saw an ad for come, come meet hipster Santa. I just like my, I rolled my eyes to death, but <laughs> apparently a lot of people really love it. I got mine for free. Cause I, what happened was I was like, Oh, you know what? Uh, um, I saw him and I was in the middle. I can't remember the name of the mall. That's right in the middle of downtown. Oh, Pioneer Place. Pioneer Place. So that's why I was walking. That's where he was. And I was walking around that Pioneer Place and I saw it and I was just, I, I just got swept up in the, the merriment that is the holiday season. And I, you know, I was, and he was just sitting by himself and I kind of felt bad that he was just sitting there by himself and no yeah, one was taking like the, the non rush hour. Yeah. And it kind of has a lot of time to kill. I was like going to go see a movie or something like that. I remember I asked him and he goes, well, technically I'm not, not working. The camera's not working, but if you want it, and that photo comes like, if you want to take a picture, you can take a picture with your phone and it won't cost you anything. Yeah. Nobody and, needs a professional camera anymore. Yeah. And I got a, I got a free picture with Santa because the, the, their, their camera packets that they were selling wasn't working. So I got to have a free, I was like, what, what a wonderful Christmas gift. Did, did you make that your card? Did you, you send out cards? I, I didn't make it. I just made it my, you know, something on Instagram or wherever I put it, everything like that. But it was it was just a really nice kind of like what a what a wonderfully uh, quirky thing that can happen in this in this right. city. I I played Santa before too. Um, I was going to ask. I was going to ask if you had upgraded yourself. Well, that was not on the train. Um, there were times in, when they would be short on Santas and they would like slap a beard on whatever elf was was able to do it. I that was too much anxiety. That was too much pressure for me. You have, we have to we have to delve right into this. We have to go. So you would say that being an elf is better than being a Santa. For me, yeah, I think. Um, I, I don't know why. It, it just seems like uh, those are very big shoes to fill to be Santa convincingly. Where you're a very spelt, uh, spelt person, I would think. I was like, did you have to? What was the what was the accoutrement that you had to add up to the Santa thing? I don't know that they like gate had like belly pillows for anybody or anything. Um, the one time I did it, it was not for kids. It was for um, a, a Christmas party for a local theater oh. uh, group, which I was part of. So that was fun. It was all adults. I could say, you know, body revolting things as Santa and not ruin anybody's innocence. Um, <laughs> that was that was some of the most fun I've ever had. And then they broke out the karaoke and I sang. Uh, shake it off as Santa Claus with just this huge dance party raging around me. Man, that's a that's a very fond Christmassy memory. There's something very I like the idea of a Santa just getting down to that sick beat, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, right. I didn't do it in a Santa voice. I didn't commit to that level. If there were kids around, I may have had to. I like I like I like that it's just such it's kind of like this weird thing. I mean, I'm not sure how how much outside of the United States what's the pop i know it's very it's like it's a very brand rec you can recognize santa anywhere in the world but i'm not sure how, what the level is of, of popularity santa is everywhere you know like it started in germany or wherever it started but uh i being an american santa must have been just just interesting and you got to be the kind of santa that you got to be the adult santa which is great because did you have people like sit on your lap and like ask for things that they wouldn't have asked right. for or like took took a lot of pictures on my lap yeah 
Yeah. What is it about what they're sticking their tongue in my ear or whatever? You know, it's theater people. I went, I wonder when that started because you don't see like really civil war picture like Ken Burns style photos of like Abraham Lincoln and just him, him just standing there all like, you know, broken up in the war and Santa's right next to him, like rubbing his shoulders or whatever it is. Well, I know that the, um, the American version of Santa kind of was brought on by Coca-Cola which is why he dresses in red and white was because they started putting him in Coke uh, ads probably in the, you know, early, early 1900s. Everything something. comes down to marketing. Everything it's, is it's down true. to marketing. It's true. A lot of people don't realize that that's, that's the only reason he dresses in those colors is because he was made a Coke commercial. And before that he, he wore, you know, dark colors. He was kind of like, he would wear like a, more like a animal hide or something like that. Right. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I see, sometimes I see, we have something in Austin where sometimes you see like blue Santas, which means like he's a friend of the police department and the police department <laughs> gives oh, away. So yeah, and that, that's a whole thing that you can deal with in your head. And then you see sometimes there's Santas that are, uh, like I said, the camouflage Santa, Santas. You go to like a, you go to a Bass Pro shop and Santas in camo. <laughs> So there's 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 a different kind of Santa depending on the different area. Wow, I think there's maybe caters to more uh, different mindsets with their Santas. I thought of the dumbest dumbest uh, joke in my head. I go, you know that ludicrous song? Uh, there's different ho ho hos for different area codes. You know, <laughs> like oh. it's very dumb. I mean, but... of course we we have hipster Santa. So who am I to uh, disparage? Um, now that you've played Santa, and like I said, you, I'm sorry you didn't get paid right away. Was the pay once you got your check, was that was that a pretty good paycheck or was that just OK? I think it was. Uh, I know that I think part of the reason was they were having some kind of money troubles. And a lot of the uh, it was so it was me and Kevin and some other local like theater people or actors. And the, the vast majority of the elves were local teenagers and some of whom had done it many years running. And I remember some of those uh, those teenagers saying, I got a check for half what I got last year for the same hours and then I tried to deposit it and it bounced Oof. so that kind of thing was happening a lot and I remember just going weeks on end without getting any pay like the the um, the deadlines would come and go and you're you're really trying to make merry you're really trying to be cheerful when in the back of your mind you're kind of like adding up your rent and adding up your bills and thinking shit I'm gonna need to get paid like today or I'm fucked while you're wearing an elf costume. These are the thoughts that are plaguing you. Had anyone, did you notice any Santas or elves, as you say, they were teenagers, get fired from Santa, Santa land or the, the train? So in addition to the elves, there were also people who wore giant plush uh, animal costumes. There was a giant squirrel. There was a giant cat. One time the cat came, you know, it's like this six, uh, a six foot cat with a giant headpiece wanders through. The kids loved those. And I said one time, yeah, I had to you know, clean his litter box last night. And the kids thought it was really funny. And then the next time I tried that same joke, everybody was repulsed and everybody was mad that I was so gross. So you never know quite what your audience is going to be. Maybe I got overconfident and said it with too much bravado the second time. Um, but there was, there was a squirrel. I had to be the squirrel a couple times when nobody else was available to do it. I wear glasses. I put the headpiece on. My glasses immediately go opaque uh, <laughs> with condensation and, and fog. And you know, visibility in that head isn't great even under normal circumstances. So I was kind of like feeling my way through, really hoping I didn't like step on any children or knock any over in the you know vestibule or in the rocking train. Oh, but OK, so the kid who got fired <laughs> So he was in, Kevin actually caught him. He was in the vestibule between train cars wearing the entire squirrel <laughs> costume and smoking weed <laughs> on the clock and dressed as a squirrel. I mean, if you're gonna pick, if you're gonna pick an animal to be the paranoid jumpy kind, it's definitely the squirrel. Right. <laughs> but like a squirrel least, smoking some sativa, you know? At least take off the costume so you don't stink it up because now it's gonna <laughs> smell like weed for the next the whole rest of December. Anyway, he got fired. That was pretty hilarious. Oh, I can't even imagine 
catching a gigantic like like what kind of Cronenberg kind of nightmare is seeing a squirrel smoke weed on a train? <laughs> that is terrifying. It was it's a weird thing, man. Talk about Cronenberg. I was on that train for so many hours for so many days in a row, and you know every time the um, the train door slides open. You see, it's because the, the cat or the squirrel is coming in. All the kids are like, yay, or Santa's coming in. And it's a big deal. And I remember after several days in a row, I was at a bar, as many people would be, uh, just, you know, drinking and trying to come down after a really rough night. And I remember I was by the door and every time the door opened to the bar, like my brain half expected, oh, the giant squirrel's about to come in for a split second. It's kind of kind of like combat PTSD in a way, you know? You get a little those, bit, you know, like a little bit like the Christmas Hurt Locker or something, you know? <laughs> it's exactly what it was. Just Did like you, the visual and the audio cue of like the, the door opening. It's oh, time to get in character, and, you know, <laughs> just for a split second. And I'd be like, oh man, this thing has, has broken my brain fully. Did you have any- if That doesn't happen anymore. That would be terrifying. <laughs> I'll do that. Do you have any temptation to take your elf costume or take the Santa costume and just go drink at a bar? Oh man, I couldn't get out of that thing fast enough. I I, I had no desire to wear it. Uh, <laughs> the clock. I don't know if that was just like I don't know if that, it'd be just it'd be really funny just to see like what kind of drink an elf would order. Just be like, just the right, yeah, something very noggy. Yeah, very noggy, or 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 something even like insane. Like yeah, I'll just like I'm seeing. I don't know if if, if it's just the weird nonsensical part of my brain. It's like just an as elf ordering a sex on the beach would be like. Okay, that's what that's what he thinks an adult should drink. Like, I gotta check that elf's ID because how old is? Because uh, uh, do you do you subscribe in your head as an elf? Are they are they adults? Are they teenagers? Are they like like are they stuck in? What is an elf to you? Well, I would always recommend um, like to the teenagers or whatever. Don't take on any kind of uh, character voice or extreme characterization because it's going to get to you. It's going to be a lot really fast. You know, don't talk in a, in a weird pinched voice. Just use your normal voice. Just be, you, you know, be friendly with the kids. Be nice, but don't uh, devote yourself to constantly making up stories about the North Pole or whatever. Um, just kind of relax a little bit. Nice. That's a good way to look at it. I never, I, just, I like the idea of, of, of you just like, telling the kids about some local portland like places that you like the train you should go have you right. ever been to like the elliot smith taco bell that's a that's a <laughs> wonderful if you want to have a magical time that's really weird that you said that because when when i was at the bar and uh, the door was always opening and it was freaking me out i was drinking at my father's place which was elliot mm -hmm. smith's aunt when he was around maybe even in the same elliot smith booth you know you're an elf for a while and you start to feel you start to get that kind of Elliot Smith melancholy. And there's a, uh, for people that have been in, in my father's place, there's a little bit of the Christmas lights that are always up every, I think every oh, day of the right. year. Yeah, the whole ceiling is kind of this this network of Christmas lights and there's even more up during the holiday. I haven't yeah. set foot uh, in a bar during the pandemic. Though, so I, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't even either. I mean, I, as a comedian, I did a couple of shows outdoors during like, during the dip during the when we're like okay look we're 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 maybe going to get out it was like right, right around Chappelle was doing that and yeah so it was when it was safe it was outdoors there was only a couple people on the bill we all used different mics i kind of felt like okay we'll be safe we wore masks but other than that i have not stepped inside a bar that, did you find that people were as willing to laugh uh, people were kind of nervous people yeah. were kind of nervous but it was it was really good it was really nice because people were excited about a human being and talking about stuff and trying to connect with them. I think that was something that was great to see. It, it unlocks something in your brain to be able to see someone on a stage or to be on a stage yourself. I've done a lot of, uh, a lot of acting, a lot of theater. I haven't been on a stage in a year and uh, man, I really miss it. I, I can imagine if I did something like that, even if it were a, a smaller distanced crowd, it still probably is, is a great catharsis for it. You. It really was. I mean, I hadn't been on stage in about, I think at that point it had been like four to six months. So I had to go like, make sure I could still do the darn thing and practice my jokes and, right, and get up yeah. there. But it, but it was great. And then afterwards, uh, everyone thanked me for stuff. Everyone was very safe. There was, and it was, it was just, it was really, and then I have, I've done two shows since the pandemic started. And then I just like, nope, no more. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people can do whatever they want, but I just like, you know, Texas yeah. is a little looser with the restrictions than right, everywhere right. else. So I'm like, I'm not going to, 
tell people they can't. I wish I could, but who who am I to tell? You know, I, I just like, I'm going to wear my mask. I'm going to stay in my house. Yeah. I'm going to talk to people on Zoom. I'm going to share my content, my my way of expression safely. And I don't want to give anyone else a reason to be angry at me That's or, really but you know, they, been, yeah. they should know better by now. We all know, we all know the thing by this point. Yeah. I mean, fortunately uh, for me, I do have other artistic outlets. Like I draw a lot. I do a lot of art commissions for people and for people's holiday cards and things like that. And usually I balance it out. Like that's the more introverted part of me will stay inside for days at a time working on something and really trying to get it right. And then the more extroverted side will go and be on stage and, uh, you know, do comedy or play silly characters or whatever. And, you know, that's not an option. So like it's, it's, it's taken over and I've gotten a lot done and I'm proud of what I've gotten done, but it's, um, it doesn't fully satisfy me. You know, yeah. I miss people, I miss, I miss performing for people. I miss, uh, just being backstage, be, being a part of an ensemble, you know, that part is, um, I, I can't get back to that soon enough, you know? We, we've been talking for a little bit and I, uh, we've been talking and it's been a wonderful chat. I've been so glad to, to, to get to know you right now. And I really enjoyed your point of view. I like, I like your perspective on things. I, for, oh, for, for two people basically being strangers, it's nice to talk and just have a conversation that has lasted right, right, right underneath an hour. But like, I was thinking, since you are a trained actor, maybe you give us a little bit of uh, how long you've been doing it. What was your favorite role? Because this podcast is also about jobs. So as, as acting is a job like any other, tell us about maybe a, a favorite job that you had in acting uh, or a story about an audition, anything like that. And then we're going to, we, we're going to wrap it up. But like, this has been by, by no means, don't make it fast. Take your time. Think about your most favorite audition or favorite role. And I want people to know you outside of the, the candy coating that is your elf costume. Well, we do. Um, I've been doing it since I was 14 or 15 years old. I started doing theater in high school and was like, hey, this is a good outlet for me. I enjoy it. And um, I've been in all kinds of things, you know, musicals, sketch comedy, uh, what have you. And one one biz that's kind of kind of booming in Portland during normal times is you get a lot of uh, stage adaptations of movies, and usually comedy versions of of non comedy movies. And it was just just a little over two years ago. I was in a stage version of The Thing. Oh, John Carpenter version of The Thing, which is one of my favorites. Love it, love that movie. Yeah, and it, we did it. We played it for laughs. We did it as a comedy. But we weren't, not in a way that made fun of the suspense or made fun of the structure of the story or took anything away. Like, it was more like if, if it were the story as it is, except all the characters are like the characters from Police Academy is sort of how we, uh, how we did it. Because, you know, they all kind of have their quirks and there's things to exaggerate. And I got to play Windows, which was exactly the part I wanted the most, just kind of like neurotic, has a shitty attitude. He dies just far enough into the story that he can still really make an impact. And he dies stupid. He like just stares at the thing, like unable to, uh, like emotionally unable to turn on the flamethrower that it's in his hands because he's so freaked out. Just stands there staring and blinking at the creature for like five seconds until finally it whisks him off the floor and he flails around his little puppet legs, which is something that we did too. Um, I got replaced. I've been killed in many, many plays in my time. I usually play antagonists or characters who are um, who are angry in some way or are uh, intense in some way, and a lot of the time I get killed. This was the first play I've been killed in where the um, the thrashing and the death was so severe that they had to swap me out for a cloth dummy of myself, which is something I'm very proud of. <laughs> that was a good, just that whole cast was wonderful. That was I made. I made so many friends doing that show. And when it's when it's of a, you know, you're adapting a movie that you already love, that's so much fun to do. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy that we spoke today. And like I said, I hope that this, I hope both of our industries can come back in a, in a safe and hopefully expedient way where a lot of our friends who rely on the money and I hope you're doing okay with unemployment. I hope something's working out where, Kevin was, I looked at, I read Kevin Michael Moore's story about unemployment and I was like, Kevin really went through hell. And then, and then finally, I think he got like 57 checks in one day, but yeah. for the better part of this year, um, he was having a really hard time, but now he's good. I've, I've been luckier than most. Uh, I've been selling art 
And as my friend Megan pointed out, you know, one reason that I might be selling more art than usual this year is people are stuck at home all day. They're looking at their walls that don't have anything on them. There's no other scenery to be had. So they think, hey, I'm going to I'm going to buy something to put up there, which is as good as ex an explanation as any. So in, in some ways, I, I've benefited from it, but, you know, it's it's not worth it. I yeah. really want to get back to being around people. And being Definitely. Around I do too, and but this is in 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 the interim. This is a wonderful substitution, as safe as we can be. Because, like I said, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to give you get you sick, and I I imagine right. you wouldn't want to get me sick. But where can people find your art if they would if they want to buy your art or anything else that you want to share? This is the last part of the episode. Just let them know where they can find you if they want to get more Greg. Absolutely, you can find my Instagram. Uh, my Instagram handle is uh, Dollar Taco Night. That's night N I T E. I also have a Tumblr, which I guess is kind of uh, antiquated these days, but a lot of my art is there uh, in bigger form and in, in, in better to observe form than you would find it shrunk down into those little uh, tiny Perfect. Instagram squares. And that's just uh, gregbagoni.tumblr.com. I'll connect everything on the YouTube comments and we'll go from there. So it'll be great. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, thank you so much for talking to me today. This has been really wonderful. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah and I'm getting to know you. Yeah, how how what are you doing for the holiday season? I didn't. Ask, well, end it with that. What are you doing this holiday? This 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 Christmas, Christmas Eve kind of thing. Do you have any traditions that you're doing or anything that um, you're doing? I'm gonna be meeting up with my family, which is just my immediate family, just uh, five of us, including my sister-in-law, and uh, unwrap presents, and we're probably gonna watch, uh, you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation or something like that. It's gonna nice. be small scale. Usually, we go out and see. The extended family but i think everyone is is under agreement that that's not really the way to to play it this year anything you're looking forward to any any cooking anything in the stocking anything that you're asking santa for this year specifically oh you know art supplies are always great and you know this is pretty cool crayola maybe 50 years after they should have done this i, I use crayons a lot as a medium crayola just put out a pack of like 36 Crayons of different uh, skin tones called Colors of the World or something wow. like that. It's like, that is a great idea. Very and, cool. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, it's the same. In Christmas, I always kind of revert to being six years old in a lot of ways, not usually to the point where I ask for a box of crayons for <laughs> Christmas, but uh, I'm kind of excited for it. I'm, I'm excited for a, a box of multicultural crayons. Yeah. That, that's a wonderful way to end this episode. I'm excited for your box of multicultural crayons too. I yeah. hope that you can. I hope that you can have a crayon that looks like me that says uh, uh, "very melanin deprived Latino" <laughs> in there or something like that. <laughs> well, from the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> right? You know, or lived here for a while. It's kind of a given. We all end up looking a little pasty. I know this is my base coat of of, of Latin. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Greg. It was nice talking to you, and we'll talk to you again real soon. You too, man. Thank you. So have much. a good, happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Same to you. Bye. Bye.